In this video, I'm looking at the Beatles UK EPs, specifically at this 1981 EP box set, and find out how they compare to the first pressing originals. Hi, I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions. After the success of the Singles Collection in 1976 and the BC13 LP box set in 1978, EMI turned its attention to the Beatles EPs. EMI had introduced the 45 7-inch EP, or Extended Play, into their catalogue in 1954. But it wasn't until Rock and Roll hit three years later that they really took off. These mini vinyl masterpieces wrapped in glossy colour picture sleeves, were cheaper than albums and better value than singles, and proved irresistible to teenage record buyers growing up in gloomy late 50s Britain. The years 1958 to 1964 were the golden years for the EP in the UK, which soon became so popular that they were given their own chart in 1960. Some titles sold so well that they even entered the singles chart, which was no mean feat in those days. By 1965, the album market was maturing, and albums, once just a collection of fillers around one song or a theme, were attracting more attention from the record-buying public, and EP sales began to fall away. Despite the Beatles giving the EP one last shot in the arm in December 1967 with their Magical Mystery Tour double EP, the format never recovered, and Cilla Black's Time for Cilla became EMI's final EP release in September 1968. BEP 14 was released on the 7th of December 1981. The box containing 14 7-inch 45 RPM EPs followed the style of the BC 13 LP box set with its gold lettering and front flip-over opening. The set is nearly always referred to as the EP collection, but looking closely at the lettering on the box, this odd little mark appears to be an S. So technically, it should be the EP's collection. The box contained faithful reproductions of all 12 mono 4-track EPs, together with a stereo copy of the Magical Mystery Tour double EP set. The box has a neat little section inside, which makes space for the oversized Magical Mystery Tour cover and keeps all the others tight and in place. Like the LP set before it, this set included a bonus disc in the form of this four-track EP, but we'll come on to that a little later on. Like the originals, the picture sleeves retain their two rear flip-overs, but gone were the high-gloss front panel finish of the originals, which was replaced by a cheaper-looking eggshell finish. I've actually got two of these sets, one is an early copy and the other is from towards the end of production. The discs in the early set were pressed at EMI's main factory at Hayes and have push-out centres. The discs in the later set have solid centres and were pressed at EMI's second plant in nearby Southall in South London, which, until EMI bought it out in the early 1980s, was owned by Virgin, who used to press its own 45s, amongst others. Solid centres were nothing new. EMI had begun pressing them way back in 1966, and some of the original EPs had them. These are a few I've come across over the years. The Beatles Hits, Beatles Number One, Long Tall Sally, Extracts from the Film A Hard Day's Night, Beatles for Sale, and Nowhere Man. All of these were produced in very small quantities and are now highly collectible. So now let's have a look at each EP from this set and see how they compare to the original 1960s UK first pressings. Although it has a later catalogue number than the Beatles hits EP, Twist and Shout was, due to overwhelming demand, the first EP to be released, on July the 12th, 1963 in fact. It ended up selling over 800,000 copies that year 
and still remains the biggest selling EP in UK pop history. Like all of the UK EPs, it was released in a colour picture sleeve. This famous image, taken by the late Fiona Adams, was shot at a bomb site behind London's Euston Railway Station. Also, like all of their early EPs, it had specially written sleeve notes by loyal press officer Tony Barrow on the back. The earliest pressings of the original EP had 1N matrices on both sides, but side 1 was quickly recut to 2N a few weeks after release. And it's that exceptional 1963 2N-1N coupling which remains on this pressing. The N, by the way, in these matrices denotes that the cutting was done on EMI's German-built Neumann lathes, a practice which would continue until 1965. The Beatles' Hits EP was released in November 1963 and contained both sides of their first two Parlophone singles. However, the version of Love Me Do included on it was the standard album version and not the original 1962 single version with Ringo on drums. The version of Please Please Me here was also copied from the album Master and is not the superior Delta mono mix which appeared on the original 45. The 1N matrix on side 1 of this EP was also recut as 2N shortly after release and that remains on this pressing, but side 2 has been recut as dash 2. The Please Please Me LP was plundered once again for their next EP, The Beatles No. 1. To give the fans a little something different, the cover used an alternate shot from the Please Please Me album cover session, which is only really obvious when they're compared side by side. This 1981 issue retains its original 1963 1N matrices on both sides. All My Loving could have easily been a standalone 45, but EMI coupled it here with money from With The Beatles, along with two leftovers from Please Please Me. Both sides were recut for this set by HTM, the Beatles' original cutting engineer, Harry Moss. Their next release was the first to contain tracks exclusive to an EP, and probably represented the peak of the format, for the Beatles anyway. Long Tall Sally was released on the 4th of July 1964, and by early 1965 had sold over a quarter of a million copies in the UK. The original pressing had 1N matrices on each side, but this issue has dash 2 recuts on both sides, courtesy of cutting engineer Nick Webb. Nick Webb was by then an Abbey Road veteran, having started work there in 1968. He'd worked his way up from second engineer on albums like Procol Harum's Salty Dog and The Pretty Thing's Parachute, and in 1974 he moved to the cutting department, where he cut many classic albums by all the EMI heavyweights, including Pink Floyd, Queen and Iron Maiden. He also cut Wings London Town and Back to the Egg albums, so he was certainly qualified to cut anything in this set. November 1964 saw the release of the first of two EPs containing tracks from the A Hard Day's Night album, which at that point was already four months old, an eon in the world of mid-60s pop. It was in truth a bit of a cash grab by EMI, and unlike earlier releases, no expense was spent on new artwork, which just copies the album. The first pressing had 1N, 2N matrices, but carries uncredited Dash 2, Dash 3 recuts for this issue. The next EP was released just two days later, and was unimaginatively titled Extracts from the Album A Hard Day's Night, and included four songs from side two of the UK album. This became the Beatles' first not to top the EP charts, and was an early sign that the record-buying public were tiring of the format. In fact, EMI was still using unused first-pressing labels of this EP on later 1970s reissues. Their eighth Parlophone EP, Beatles for Sale, came out in April 1965, again four months after the album's release. As with the previous EP, the cover just copied the album, and like the Beatles themselves, the EP format was now looking tired. The original matrices for this disc were 1N, 1N, but this set has later Dash 2, Dash 3 cuttings. 
The art department pulled their socks up for the next release in June 1965, which produced one of the finest sleeves of the series. However, despite its fabulous Robert Freeman cover shot, Beatles for Sale No. 2's four tracks from side two of a six-month-old album failed to inspire sales, which is why it's particularly hard to find today. The original pressing had Dash 1 matrices on both sides, but the cuttings presented here are both Dash 2 Harry Moss recuts. In late March 1964, EMI planned to release an EP called The Beatles' Golden Discs, which was to contain four of their biggest selling singles to date. Test pressings were made and it was even allocated a catalogue number, GEP 8899, the label proofs of which still reside in the well-guarded EMI archives. But with the two A Hard Day's Night EP still in the charts and the Beatles for Sale album on the way, its release was cancelled. However, the idea was revived and a year later appeared as The Beatles' Million Sellers on the 11th of December 1965. First pressing copies still bore the original title, The Beatles' Golden Discs. But later pressings, like this one, had the corrected Million Sellers title on the labels. Although containing four of their biggest hit singles, this wasn't a huge seller compared to earlier releases. After all, any Beatles fan worth their salt already owned all the singles, and the only attraction for fans was Robert Whittaker's quirky cover shot. This box set pressing retains its original Dash 1 Side 1 cutting, but Side 2 is replaced by a Dash 2. By the time Yesterday was released in March 1966, seven months had gone by since its first appearance on the Help album. The EP sold fairly well, helped by the fact that the UK was one of the only countries in which Yesterday had not been released as a standalone single. The first pressings were Dash 1-1, and side one on this pressing retains that original side one matrix, but side two is a Nick Webb recut. The Beatles' final four track EP was Nowhere Man in July 1966 and consisted of four tracks from the now seven month old Rubber Soul album. Again, the cover shot of the group in the grounds of Chiswick House is the only real reason to own this EP, both then and now. Side 1 on this box set retains its original Dash 1 cutting, but Side 2 is an anonymous Dash 3 recut. The last gasp of the EP format came in December 1967, with the Magical Mystery Tour double EP set. The original had Dash 1 matrices on Sides 1, 3 and 4, with a Dash 2 on Side 2. The discs from this box set has Nick Webb recuts on all sides except I Am The Walrus, which retains its original 1967 cutting. Incidentally, the copy of this EP in the later set is the only one which has a different matrix, which updates the side 2 cutting to a dash 3. Something else which had changed on this set was the colour of the inner sleeves, from white to black. Wanting to give collectors a reason to buy this set, EMI tried once again with the rare stereo mixes angle, which had been promised, but not delivered, on the Rarities LP in the BC-13 box set in 1978. This untitled bonus EP was given the catalogue number SGE1, and the classy shot by French photographer Jean-Marie Perrier, originally used for the Strawberry Fields Penny Lane picture sleeve, was chosen for the front cover. However, EMI found out they no longer held the original artwork or a negative, so they turned to a Swedish collector who lent them a pristine sleeve for them to copy. As the cover correctly states, this EP was indeed the Inner Light's first outing in true stereo. However, it wrongly says that Baby or a Rich Man's only other stereo outing had been on the Magical Mystery Tour cassette and German album. Well, that wasn't the full story because it had also been included in stereo on the World Records box set the previous year. They got their facts straight on She's a Woman, about it having been released in stereo in Australia and on the aforementioned World Records box, but failed to mention anything about its previously unheard counting, which was included here. Now, I've never been in a band, but to my ears, that counting sounds wrong, out of time and may have been flown in from somewhere else. If you have this EP, take a listen and let me know what you think.
As on the Rarities LP, poor tape research let the side down once again, as the version of this boy presented here is the same reprocessed stereo version as released on the Love Songs album in 1977. It had actually received a proper stereo mix way back in 1966, during the preparation for a collection of Beatles oldies, when someone misheard and mixed it in stereo instead of Bad Boy. So how do the EPs in this box set sound? Should you save up and get the originals? Or does this set sound better? Let's find out. Compromises in sound quality were always going to have to be made when fitting two tracks onto one side of a 7-inch disc. And in order to fit six minutes onto one side, the grooves had to be narrowed by lowering the cutting level and increasing compression. But as I've said before when I reviewed the singles box, these were never meant to be sonic masterpieces. To begin with, the tracks on the EP were copied from the master tapes, so they're already one generation away from the master. As this comparison of the track Long Tall Sally shows, both the 1964 and 1981 issues are dynamic and exciting, with both looking and sounding just as good as each other. Having listened to them all alongside a set of the originals, I'm pleased to report that the EPs in the box set compare extremely well, with none undergoing any significant changes in sound. There's a little more high-end air on the Beatles for Sale EP, for example, but all remain true to the exciting dynamic sound of the first pressings. Is there any difference between the sound on the earlier sets and the later sets? Well, the truth is they both sound great, so there's no need to bother trying to find an earlier set thinking it'll sound better. A lot of people hold the Japanese red vinyl EP box in high regard, but pretty as they are, all the mono tracks in it, apart from Magical Mystery Tour, are fold downs of the stereo mixes. So take my advice and stick to the UK box. By the way, the CD box sounds terrific too. It's basically a straight flat digital copy of the original analog EP masters with no noise reduction or anything. So you can put that on your shopping list too. Unfortunately, the boxes themselves don't age well, and it's tough to find a copy that doesn't look a little beaten up. But usually, the EPs inside are in great shape. So if you don't want to spend the time and money in tracking down all of the original EPs, I strongly advise you to get one of these sets. You won't be disappointed. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a big thumbs up, subscribe or join the channel for extra content and that will help me make more videos like this. But I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.